It's a daily tribute a mother wishes she didn't have to make. It's something you say to yourself all the time that this could be the last time you see them, but you don't really believe it. You really and truly don't believe it. Her son Scott's opioid abuse began with a routine prescription for painkillers after having his wisdom teeth out. The medication ran out, so he turned to the street. As the grip of addiction tightened, he lost his partner, his home, and his plans to be a chef in Calgary. Then came his final attempt at treatment. He was there for three months, successfully completed the program, and relapsed within 12 hours and was gone. A suspected mix of heroin and fentanyl ended her son's life two years ago. Tantardini says Scott should have had access to a safe replacement for street drugs. People who, you know, never touched a drug before who are addicted to opioids and they're, they're dying because they have to get their fix. Deciphering the trends in opioid use and abuse in Canada is complex. As we found out, thefts and losses from pharmacies are going up, even though the total quantity of opioids being prescribed is declining. And at the same time, the number of people dying from opioid-related overdoses has hit an alarming high, suggesting the demand for hard drugs in Canada is unrelenting. When that supply goes, you're left with a much less safer supply of illegal drugs. British Columbia's former chief medical officer was at the forefront of the opioid crisis, which saw a surge in overdoses fueled by fentanyl. Some of those people who've had their prescriptions cut back have moved to the streets, but to the degree that prescription opioids were being diverted to the streets, they have been replaced by much more dangerous and toxic illicit opioids. Health Canada says it's tightening monitoring of pharmacies by auditing them regularly. In addition to doctors cutting back opioid prescribing, the government also wants to restrict the marketing of prescription painkillers. This pharmacist and researcher says the changes are only one part of the equation. I think we have to have a multifaceted approach to try to address both the supply and the demand sides of this. And, and we're just trying to address the supply constantly because they're the easiest policies to in place. Since Scott's death, Health Canada has loosened access to prescription heroin and methadone. Hard to say if that would have saved him. It's like leaks in the Grand Canyon and, you know, we're putting bubble gum in the holes and hoping it holds. Sandy Tantardini <laughs> has started a support group for other moms dealing with the same pain. She also honors her son's memory in other ways, such as this tree planted with some of his ashes and this tattoo. So Scott's always with her, just like the grief. Vicadopia, CBC News, Toronto. As Vic pointed out, the demand for drugs won't simply ease off with a clampdown on prescription opioids. Addiction doesn't care about policy change. In fact, clamping down on another opioid may have helped open the door for the fentanyl crisis in the first place. Back in 2012, Ontario led other Canadian provinces in pulling OxyContin from pharmacy shelves. It was replaced with a new version called OxyNeo that was billed as tamper-resistant and harder to abuse. But look at the rise of fentanyl since that happened. In 2012, 217 street drug samples tested positive for fentanyl. Since then, the numbers have basically doubled each year. By 2017, more than 6,400 samples contained fentanyl. That pattern continues in 2018. And just look at how those figures overlap with these. In 2012, fentanyl was only detected in 4% of fatal drug overdoses in British Columbia, one of the hardest hit provinces. By 2015, it was almost a third. By last year, 84%. This year's early figures are tracking the same way.